We thought that you would talk to us for 10 or 15 minutes or so about what you think about the key issues facing the world and so on. Uh, in terms of the economy, uh, what has been going on here for the last 40 years is that there has been a significant decline in the American middle class. That means that despite a huge increase in productivity and technology, uh, the average American family is working longer hours below wages, median family income has gone down by almost $5,000 since 1999. So the first question that we have to ask is how does it happen with an explosion of technology and productivity that people today in the middle of our economy are worse off than they used to be? Uh, in terms of distribution of income, uh, what we are seeing now in America is Virtually all of the new income being generated is going to the top 1%. 99% of all new income generated since the Wall Street crash is going to the top 1%. In terms of distribution of wealth, you have a situation now where the top one-tenth of 1% 1 in America owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90%. You have one family, the owners of Walmart, owning more wealth than the bottom 40% of the American people. And just in the last two years, this is really quite amazing, the wealthiest 14 people in America, that is Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, those guys, have seen their wealth increase by a hundred and fifty-seven billion dollars. Increasing wealth in the last two years, which is more wealth than the bottom 42% of the American people. So you are seeing this grotesque income and wealth inequality, which is worse than any other major country on earth, and worse in this country than any time since the late 1920s, before the Great Depression. So that's issue number one. Massive levels of poverty, real unemployment is 11% counting those people who have given up looking for work or working part-time. Youth unemployment, 17%. African-American youth unemployment much higher than that. You know, look at an economy where the rich are doing phenomenally well, almost everybody else is losing ground. That's issue number one. Issue number two is that in America, uh, as a result of a very right-wing Supreme Court, uh, we have seen a number of decisions in recent years which have been absolute disasters. And perhaps the worst one uh, dealt with the Supreme Court case, Supreme Court case on Citizens United, uh, which basically said that billionaires can now spend as much money as they want on the election process. And that means that families like the Koch brothers, the second wealthiest family in America, worth about 85 billion, are now prepared to spend some 900 million dollars in the next election to buy right wing candidates. And not only the White House, but the Senate, the House, government offices, and that's what they are preparing to do. So this Citizens United decision is really threatening the fabric of American democracy. Uh, many, many liberals accuse Hillary Clinton, you might have heard of her, of not being progressive enough. Will part of your campaign be aimed at forcing Mrs. Clinton to take a more progressive stance? <laughs> no, if I run, I have to make to win, uh, and it will be to speak. It, it will be to speak to the issues impacting the American people. And I think there are millions of people uh, who are absolutely frustrated and angry with what is going on now, and they want leadership to begin to not only speak to these issues, but to bring about the change that we need. This is the United States, the wealthiest country in the history of the world. And yet we have the highest rate of travel copy of any major country ever, et cetera, et cetera. So my race is not against Hillary Clinton, if I may. It is to rally the American people to take on the billionaire class and start doing the things that have to be done for working families in America. Will it end up any pressure on Hillary Clinton? I expect that it will, because I think you're going to see more and more people responding to that message. 
Hi. Uh, thanks. The, ne the next question is, is there much public awareness or interest in the U.S. about TTIP or the Trans-Pacific equivalent? <laughs> The major American television networks, ABC, CBS, and NBC, have yet to mention one word about the TPP. In other words, it's the largest trade agreement in the history of America. The other stations have had minimal discussion about it. So among the unions and, and a, you know, a, a, a part of American society, it is seen as a very important issue. The AFL-CIO, our trade union confederation, has made it their number one issue. They're doing a good job. They're raising consciousness on it. But I think you go out on the streets and you say to me, what do you think about trans-specific partnership with the trade union with your people would not know uh, what you're talking about, which then raises another issue, and that is the role of the media in American politics, uh, which we can talk about for a long, long time. But uh, suffice to say, uh, the media does not do a particularly good job in informing the American people about the major issues our country faces. Great. Uh, next question is, do you see the potential for an economic populism movement uh, in the current uh, public unrest uh, regarding race and social issues? Absolutely, I do. Thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> this is probably from a younger person. Uh, what advice do you have for aspiring politicians? Very good. Thank you very much for that. Uh, this is more, more specific. Uh, do you have any ideas how to in, uh, combat increasing assaults on abortion rights in the United States? We're facing uh, a very serious issue here in a number of states. Let me say a word about this because this speaks uh, for the heart of American politics, uh, and I think similarly uh, what's happening in other developed countries. The Republican Party has been very far to the right, uh, and their agenda is to 
give more tax breaks to billionaires to ignore climate change, to make savage cuts on the social safety net, or uh, this is called social security, get a massive cuts to the Republican budget, which they can bring back to the floor in a few days, if you can believe it, will throw 27 million Americans off of health insurance and make it harder for kids to go to college. I say that because when people look at what the Republicans stand for, they get no support at all. 90% of the people say, why are you giving tax breaks to billionaires and cutting programs that working families do? So what they do, and that's has been their strategy for many years, is change the discussion. So that the discussion, and this is certainly true in Europe, is on immigration. Uh, we hate the people coming into this country, uh, and we've got to focus on uh, uh, illegal immigration. Uh, we hate gays, and we've got to do everything we can to stop gay marriage. Uh, and, and um, you know, there's racism, subtly and not subtly, uh, involved in a number of issues. And then we have the abortion issue. So what they are doing, particularly in the state of Kansas, uh, which is maybe in some ways the most right wing, what they are doing now is while they are vigorously anti-abortion every day, they pass no piece of legislation, making it harder for a woman to get an abortion, at the same exact time, they are cutting programs for the poor. They are telling low-income people in Kansas, you cannot go to the movies, you can't go to a swimming pool if you are receiving uh, government help. So what this is, is a strategy to have the middle class get like, deflected away from the economic issues into abortion, into gay marriage, into guns, into immigration. And our political strategy is exactly the opposite is to say, well, okay, maybe you'll we'll have a disagreement on abortion. But well, let's stand together on economic issues. Let's raise the minimum wage to a living wage. Let's create the millions of jobs we desperately need. Let's save the planet from what climate change brings us. Let's work together to create a nation in which our middle class is expanding, not contracting. But the Republicans have been very, very smart uh, you know, so obviously what we're doing is working with the women's organizations uh, to fight back, but also politically to try to bring people together around the economic message. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I've got a question here that says, uh, despite your identification as a socialist, uh, you've had a long and successful political career in Vermont. Is that because Vermont is special or is it you that's special? <laughs>
who is talking about free college education, virtually free childcare, free health care, and people say, oh my god, I didn't know that. If that's what democratic socialism is about, it's not such a bad idea. <laughs> One of the things that we want to do is educate people about some of the very significant gains that some of the Scandinavian countries, for example, have made. I know it's a lot from Britain, and I know they have their problems. But many Americans have no idea of what goes on in, in the rest of the world. One more example is we have in this country, if you have a baby and you're working for a large company, we manage to fight here so you can get, I think, 13 to 26 weeks off without any pay. That's what we did. Most Americans have no idea that in most countries in Europe, uh, mothers and in state, their fathers can get time off, that there is pay associated with that. We don't know about that. So, uh, talking about the gains that are made in social democratic countries is something that I enjoy doing. Right. <laughs> Yes, we, we think you're doing very well. <laughs> uh, oh, wait, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to say, oh, uh, you, your picture went away as soon as I said that, so we, we welcome you back. Um, somebody wanted to know how long will it be before U.S. corporations pay their taxes? Uh, we have introduced legislation uh, Okay, I'm reading, I'm reading, <laughs> okay. Right, I've got some more questions, but I'm going to ask you one t t thing that I keep running into now. All the three other major parties here are explaining that they can't afford social programs because of the, the debt that the government has. Uh, I see that as a crazy idea because the government debt is not a problem. Uh, how do you see it and what's it doing in America? Well, that's absolutely the argument uh, that the Republicans are making here. I'm going to point out that in this country, uh, the Republicans are selectively concerned about the debt and the debt. Uh, when it comes to fighting the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, they didn't worry about the debt. So all of that went on to the credit card that will end up costing this country $4 to $6 trillion. They didn't worry about that. When they get tax rates to billionaires, uh, unless revenue comes in, they're not worried about the deficit. Their concern about the deficit comes uh, in a desire to cut uh, Medicare and Medicaid and education and environmental protection. That's when they're very concerned about the deficit. I mean, our argument is that the key issue facing the country is not the deficit or the debt. By the way, in America, we have reduced the deficit by over 60% since Obama has been president. Uh, the key issue is massive, massive uh, transfer of wealth from the middle class to the top one tenth of one percent. Uh, what we have seen since 1985 is somewhere around eight trillion dollars uh, leaving the middle class and, and an equal sum of money going to the top one tenth of one percent. And when that happens for a variety of reasons that also adds to the deficit. Um, so the fight that we have is to reject all of these austerity programs. They're based on absolutely flawed economics. In fact, if we want to get the economy moving and back to deficit reduction, what you do is you invest in infrastructure, education, you create jobs, uh, you increase the GDP who pay by the privileged of the middle class. So uh, we are fighting tooth and nail against this austerity budget that the Republicans are uh, developing. Uh, and furthermore, to the degree that people are concerned about the deficit, uh, the fairest way to do that is to end obviously the loopholes uh, that the rich.
rich and large corporations enjoy, so we get them to stop paying their fair share, and we take a hard look at the huge amount of money we're spending on the military. <clears throat> what we're facing in this election is very serious. We ha all the main issues that face us in terms of health, in terms of, of uh, employment, in terms of housing, the three parties have nothing to say about them. The hou housing, they talk about hundreds of thousands of units. Not one of them are talking about the fact that most people can't afford those market prices. The only party that has a po policy about <clears throat> social housing, money, the government putting money in so that people can have a house, a decent house that they can afford. In terms of the NHS, the amounts of money that they're talking about are insignificant. The NHS England said there's going to be a 30 billion pound shortfall by 2020. They've, and the other tw and 22 billion of that, the other parties say, can be made up with efficiency savings. Well, I, anybody who's been through efficiency savings knows that nonsense. And we've had 15 billion over the last few years, most of which actually turned out to be wage cuts. So that 22 billion is is is, is make believe. So they're putting putting up. The Labour Party is offering 2.5 billion. The Liberals 8 billion, and, and I think the Tories are 1 billion or something. None of them are in the vicinity. We're talking about 20 odd billion, plus making social care for the over 65s free, which will cost another 8 billion. So those are, there's a difference between a real policy that will make a difference and make believe. The problem is that we, you know the Greens are not going to form the next government. We will be back here next year talking about the collapse of the health service and people suffering. We will be talking about the fact that there's still no housing. We will be talking about the fact that still people are not earning enough to live on. The wage levels are still below what they were eight years ago. And all the rest of that. And I don't know, personally, you go to a meeting and each candidate, is, they're all very nice people and they're all plausible and they've all got some itty bitty policy to, to offer, none of which touch the, issue, the scope of the issues that we face, and people clap for all of us. And I, I don't know what that means, but it's, it's worrying. But I hope that people here know that we're in for a long haul. This election will solve nothing. It's because it's, you know, nobody, none of the people intend to solve anything. They, they, they're playing around and they want, you know, they want to get back in the cause.